This episode of the Memory Palace is brought to you by Amazon Prime's exclusive Lore. It's a chilling six-episode anthology series from executive producer of The Walking Dead and an executive producer of The X-Files based on the podcast phenomenon with over 70 million downloads. Creator and narrator Aaron Mankey explores the most terrifying tales throughout history, takes a myth that is rooted in historical folklore, and twists it, exposing timeless terrors that still haunt us today. Real life can scare you to death. Watch exclusively on Amazon Prime Video this October, starting on Friday the 13th. This episode of Memory Palace is brought to you by our friends at Article, makers of fine furniture with fantastic industrial and mid-century and Scandinavian designs. Also the makers of The Lamp that is lighting this script as I read it. They have everything you need at Article for your home, including brand new, a whole array of fine leather couches. These are really beautiful, extraordinarily well-made, just like everything they've got. And for $49, they will ship anything, including a large, beautiful leather couch to your front door, regardless of size. And you can get $50 off your first order of $100 or more at article.com slash memory palace. That's article.com slash memory palace. There once was a man from Pawtucket. His name was Sam Patch. And when he was a little kid, he did what most little kids in Pawtucket, Rhode Island did in the early 1800s. He went to work. Six days a week in the textile mills. 12 hours a day in the winter. 14 or 16 in the haze and swelter of the summer. And when Sam Patch was seven or eight, maybe nine, he did what some of the men in the mill did. On his break, little Sam would follow them up to the top of the high bluffs by the waterfall that powered the mill. And he'd jump. He'd leap out over the rocks that could break your legs and plummet down into that one spot in the river that was deep enough that you wouldn't break your neck. And for those few seconds, Falling through the air and cutting through the cold churn of the Blackstone River, he'd be free of the mill. And then he'd swim to shore and dry off and go back to finish out the day and the lifetime that lay ahead of him inside. Soon Sam's favorite escape became the favorite escape of most of the other workers. They wouldn't jump themselves, they'd sit down by the riverbank and eat their lunch and watch him do it. And Sam Patch found his calling and folly. In 1827, he had been working in the mills for a decade and a half. He was 20, and he was ready to take his lunchtime leaping to the next level. On September 30th, a crowd in the hundreds watched him plummet 70 feet from the top of Passaic Falls in Patterson, New Jersey, where he was working at the time. The next day, the papers dubbed him the New Jersey Jumper, and Sam left the mills behind for good. For two years, Sam Patch toured the Northeast. He jumped off flagpoles, off factory roofs, off ships' masts. If you could drum up a crowd and some cash, and you had access to something really tall, Sam Patch would totally jump off of it. In the fall of 1829, he climbed up onto a platform 125 feet above the Niagara River in the mist of Niagara Falls, and stepped off. He swam to shore waved up to the 10,000 spectators roaring their appreciation up top, and collected his money from the hundreds of people who had paid to sit in bleachers to get close to the action. Men admired him. Women adored him. Parents worried their children would want to be him. Sam Patch had become one of the most famous men in America by jumping off really tall things. It was a simpler time. But while that is a ridiculous route to fame, I'm not so sure it's any more ridiculous than having an inordinate amount of babies, or dating the divorced father of an inordinate amount of babies. America demanded more. They wanted more spectacular leaps, more danger. They wanted more from this man who had come from nothing. The man who had toiled in the same mills as they had, and found a way out. Who was once mired in the drudgery of an all-too-familiar existence, and had literally risen above it. But one can only rise so high. Flyers went up around Rochester, New York during the week of November 7, 1829. They promised that at 2 o'clock that Friday, the 13th, Sam Patch was going to make his final jump. He was retiring. He had taken his odd profession as far as he could, as far as anyone ever could that cold Friday afternoon in November. 
Sam Patch crawled out on a slippery ledge in the middle of a waterfall, 99 feet above the Genesee River. He got to his feet and looked out over the crowd. 8,000 people had left their looms and machines at the mills and factories to cheer on one of their own. He shouted something down to them, though his words were lost in the roar of the waterfall. And he leapt and disappeared into the water below. And when he didn't come up, when he didn't appear on shore with a wave and a bow for the crowd and a wink for the ladies, people refused to believe it wasn't part of the show. They thought it was a brilliant scheme. He'd show up next year back from the dead for another leap. Even months later, when a farmer, some miles from the city, found Sam's body in a frozen stream running through his pasture, people refused to believe that their hero was gone. The 19th century evil Knievel turned 19th century Elvis. People would say they were sure he was alive, just sure they saw him walking through Cleveland, or leaping alone by moonlight into the Mississippi, or they had caught a glimpse of him while they were sitting at their looms. He had walked out of the front door of their mill and didn't look back.